Okay, so last time we finished up with the uh, sort of example of um, uh, the auction example, the sort of extended auction example. And that was a little bit of a, you know, sort of side trip into auction theory. Um, but uh, we'll go back now to probability and sort of pick up where we left off. And we were talking about moments of distributions and about expectation in particular. So uh, what if instead of wanting to know a certain feature of a distribution of x, say the expectation of x, we instead are interested in that feature, say the expectation of some, dis of some um, function of x, okay? So for instance, we know what the distribution of x is. We really care about y, okay? This other random variable y, which is equal to g of x. And maybe we don't care about the entire distribution of y. We just care about some feature of it, like the expectation. How can we find the expectation of y? Well, we know one sort of surefire way to do it. We can figure out how y is distributed. We know how to do that, right? So if we know how x is distributed and we know y is a function of x, then we just use, you know, sort of our knowledge of functions of random variables to figure that out, okay? And then we can compute the expectation of that new distribution. No problem. But there might be an easier way. In a lot of cases, you know, this can be sort of mathematically, you know, messy or difficult. And uh, maybe we don't care about the whole distribution. Maybe we only care about the expectation. So we don't really need uh, the, the PDF of y. All we care about is the expectation of y. And so uh, in cases like that, it might be just easier to use this uh, formula. So what this tells us is that, that uh, we can compute the expectation of y, where y is a function of another random variable x. Uh, in this fashion here. So this is the sort of uh, old way that we knew how to compute it, but it might be <coughs> cumbersome or you know, too much trouble. But in fact, all we need to do is use this formula, okay? So it's, we just integrate over the support of x, g of x, and then the PDF of x, okay? So now let me... Uh, do an example where we're going to do that exact uh, calculation. Okay, so this example, it's called the St. Petersburg Paradox. It is a classic example slash paradox in probability theory, um, been sort of taught to students of probability theory for centuries probably. Uh, and this example is first discussed by 18th century Swiss mathematician uh, Nicholas Bernoulli. Okay? and published in the St. Petersburg Academy Proceedings uh, in 1738. That's where it got its name. Okay? And um, the name Bernoulli, does that sound familiar? Yeah? So I don't know if, I, I can't remember if I defined a Bernoulli distribution in this uh, class or not, but a Bernoulli distribution is just a special case of the binomial distribution. So remember, binomial distribution we can think of as n coin flips, where the probability of a success on each coin flip is p, okay, and they're independent, where a Bernoulli distribution is just one coin flip. So it's just a, a binomial where n equals one, okay? That's a Bernoulli distribution. Okay, so here's the game. I'm gonna propose a game to you, and I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna ask you how much you'd be willing to pay me to play this game, okay? I flip a fair coin until it comes up heads. And if the number of flips necessary is x, I pay you two to the x dollars, okay? So how much would you be willing to, to pay me to play this game? Does anyone want to sort of venture? I'm not gonna hold you to it, by the way. I'm not gonna, com you're not committing to play this game to me, but how, how much do you think you might be willing to pay me to play the game? Yeah. Um, I would find the expectation of x. Oh, no, without doing any calculations. We'll do the calculations in a second. Yeah. Um, I would pay a dollar because there's a 50, 50 chance that I could double. Yeah, there's, a, there's also a small chance you could get $1,000, though, right? Or more, maybe more than 1000 you know. But OK, fine, you'd be willing to pay a dollar, yeah. Any other? 
Um, no, you're you're giving away the punchline, but, but you're absolutely right. So um, so we'll come we'll come back to your answer in a second. So the 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 if to be honest, to be perfectly honest, if I said, would you be you know how much you would you be willing to pay this, pay me to play this game, you'd give me a number much less than infinity to play play the game, right? Okay. So maybe, maybe I get someone who's willing to pay me a dollar, maybe I get someone who's willing to pay me five dollars, something like that. Okay? So let's actually compute what the expected winnings of this game are. Okay? Oh, and by the way, what's this distribution? I can't remember. So you saw it on a problem set, right? Um, I can't remember whether the problem set or whether in any other time I've told you what the name of it is. It's called the geometric distribution. Okay? So it's just a coin flip until you get one, one success. Okay? And how many, how many coin flips are there until you get to that success? Okay, so makes sense, I think, at least uh, uh, I'll make that claim initially. It makes sense that you should be willing to pay your expected winnings for this game. Okay? So let's calculate the expected winnings and see what you guys are willing, you know, see if you'd be willing to pay me that um, to play this game. So let X be the number of flips required. And um, note that X has this geometric distribution with probability 0.5. Uh, I can look up. Uh, in some table of distributions what the expectation of x is, and it's equal to 2. I can also calculate it. The calculation that I would go through is a little fussy, so I won't bother doing it. But, but you, you can calculate what this expectation is, okay? Um, or you could just look it up in a table of uh, PDFs. Okay, and we'll need that uh, figure in a second. Okay, and then we define y, a new random variable y, uh, to be equal to the winnings in this game. Okay, and so that's just equal to 2 raised to the x power. Okay, so we've got two random variables x, this one has a geometric distribution, and a y. We don't know exactly what the distribution of y is, but we're, we can calculate its expectation with the formula I just put up. Okay. So in particular, this is the, uh, this is the um, discrete analog of the formula we just had up a couple of uh, slides ago. If we're interested in the expectation of y, where y is a um, function of random variable x, and we have the PDF of the random variable x, and we don't have the PDF of the random variable y, we can just use this formula. Okay, So that's what we'll do. And so let's plug in. This is the PDF of x. It's just 1 half raised to the x power, right? On your problem set, that's what you got when you did a problem similar to this. And then we multiply it by the function uh, r of x, which is 2 to the x. And we sum up over all possible values of x, OK? So all possible values of x, there could, I mean, it, we, we have to sum, we have to, this, this is an infinite sum because we don't, you know, there is some tiny probability that we could just be flipping this coin forever uh, before we get ahead, right? And so um, we're adding this up over, you know, from x equals 1 to infinity. And uh, when we multiply this out, we just get that that's 1. We're adding up 1 uh, infinite number of times we get infinity. So this is sort of uh, maybe kind of a surprising result. And certainly, if you buy my argument that you should be willing to pay your expected winnings to play this game, this result doesn't sound right at all. Because you're not, no one's willing to pay me anything close to an infinite amount of money to play this game. OK, so that's the paradox. But is it really a paradox? And the answer is. Economists, not to, not to economists, okay? So economists know that people have diminishing marginal utility of money. This is uh, sort of equivalent to being risk averse, okay? So the, 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 this is sort of another way of describing 
a utility function with risk aversion. So economists know that people have a diminishing marginal utility of money. So in other words, their valuation of additional money decreases as the amount of money they have increases. So if I win $50,000 in the lottery, that's going to mean a lot more to me than it would to Michael Bloomberg. Okay? I mean, it's just sort of tiny little rounding error in his, in his uh, uh, wealth. Okay? And so this is, this is sort of a well-known, well-documented um, sort of facet of people's you know, utility functions or valuation of money. They, um, they care less about an increment of money the more money they have. Okay? So what we really should have been doing is instead of calculating expected winnings for this game, we should have been calculating our valuation of the expected winnings. Right? So we'll just arbitrarily, so basically what diminishing marginal utility of money uh, implies is that your utility function as a function of money, the, the amount of money you have, is going to be increasing but at a decreasing rate. Okay? So that's, that's what diminishing marginal utility is going to imply. So let's just come up with some arbitrary functional form that looks kind of like this. And that's, that will say is our valuation of the winnings of this game. Okay? And so what I came up with was a log of y. Okay? And you could use many other different kind of um, functions that have this general shape. So now we have a third random variable, z. And z is going to be the valuation of the winnings. And we're just we're assuming it's log of y. And, um, and then if I plug in x here, it's just log of 2 to the x. Okay? And so now let's calculate, let's use the formula again and calculate the expectation of z and see what we get. So expectation of z is just equal to the sum from x equals 1 to infinity of log of 2 to the x. That's the, that's the function uh, that you know, we've defined as z, uh, times the PDF of x, which is 1 half to the x still. And we can rewrite this as log of uh, 2 times the sum of x to the, uh, times 1 half to the x. And then if we just use this sort of formula for an infinite um, series, we get that that is equal to 2 times log of 2. Okay? And that's a lot less than infinity. Okay. So that's the St. Petersburg paradox, but just keep in mind it's only a paradox uh, unless you know a little bit of economics, and then it, then it makes perfect sense. Okay? Questions? No. Okay, so now back to expectation, and it's going to be, so we've seen, <clears throat> we've seen the definition of expectation, and um, we have, um, uh, talked about how to compute expectations. We've talked about how to, we just saw an example, how to compute expectation of a function of a random variable. And uh, it's going to be useful for us uh, to sort of list a whole bunch of properties of expectation that will make expectation, uh, co computing expectations easier. And in particular, uh, is going to make sort of computing expectations of functions of certain random variables a lot easier, okay? So let's go through uh, the list of expectations, properties of expectations. So the first one um, is just that, and this may seem uh, pretty obvious, the expectation of a constant as opposed to a random variable is just equal to that constant, okay? And I mean, that seems not very useful and it seems obvious, but in fact, we'll sort of use this fact kind of implicitly all the time. Um, well, I'll remind you, oh, this thing is a constant, so it can come outside the expectation. Okay. Um, let's see. Or its expectation is equal to itself. Okay, the second property is that if we have a linear transformation of the random variable x, so y is equal to ax plus b, then the expectation of y is just equal to that same linear function of the expectation of x. Okay. 
Number three, um, suppose we have a bunch of random variables, x1 through xn, and y is equal to the sum of those random variables. Then the expectation of y is equal to the sum of the expectations. Okay? So this is also going to be super useful. We'll use it um, you know, many times. And I want to point out something very important about this property, which is that I haven't said anything about the x's. So in particular, I haven't said that the x's needed to be independent. And in fact, they don't need to be independent. Okay? So this is true with any x1 through xn. Okay, the fourth property is kind of a um, combination of number two and number three. And that's just saying, let's say you have a linear combination, an arbitrary linear combination of a bunch of uh, x, a bunch of x random variables. Then the expectation of that linear combination is the linear combination of the expectations. Number five, uh, if um, x and y are independent, then we have that expectation of x, y, the, the product of x and y, is equal to the product of the expectations. Okay? Okay. So in addition to, so we've been talking about expectation. Expectation is, will be the most important moment of a distribution that we are going to be concerned with, but it's not the only moment of a distribution that we care about. So in addition to describing the location or center of a distribution, um, we often uh, would like to describe how spread out it is. Okay? And there's a moment for that. And it's called variance. Okay? So here is the definition of the variance of the random variable x. So it's just equal to the expectation of x minus mu quantity squared. And here mu, I'm just using mu to stand for the expectation of x. Okay? So we, we're creating this new random variable, which is just equal to the square deviation between x and its expectation. Okay, and then we're taking the expectation of that new random variable, and that's the variance. Okay, I'll, I'll sort of give you some more examples that, you know, we'll, we'll sort of deal with variance in, in a variety of ways uh, where, you know, I think it, you'll, you'll get a good intuitive sense of what it is. Okay, uh, a, no, a note about uh, sort of terminology and notation. Uh, we often denote the variance of x with the uh, Greek symbol sigma squared, okay? And note also that variance is an expectation. So many of the properties of variance will follow from the fact that it's an expectation, okay? Okay, so just like uh, we went through the properties of expectation, We'll, we'll go through sort of a series of properties of variance as well. Mm. So the first one is that variance of any random variable is less than or equal to zero. So why is that? And just look at the definition of variance and see that it's, uh, the, the thing that's inside the expectation is always going to be non-zero. Okay? So you're taking the expectation of something that's never that's never negative, um, then it's, it's not going to be negative either. Uh, the uh, variance of A, where A is a constant, is equal to zero. Okay? Again, you just think back to the formula for variance, and we remember that expectation of a constant is equal to that constant. So then you just sort of plug in that constant, and you, you get that the uh, variance of a constant is going to be equal to zero. Okay, so remember that if we took a random variable x and we transformed it linearly, then the expectation of that transformed random variable was, was the sort of tra the linear transformation of the ex expectation. Well, something different happens with the variance of that random variable. 
So in particular, if we take a random variable and we transform it linearly, the variance um, is just multiplied by the square of the coefficient on x. And it's not affected at all by uh, this additive constant b. Okay? So what's going on here? Well, basically, uh, the variance, remember, th think back to the interpretation I gave you for variance or the motivation I gave you for variance a second ago, which is that it measured how spread out a distribution is. And so if you have a measure of how spread out a distribution is and you just shift the distribution by a constant, you would hope that that, that measure doesn't change, and it doesn't. Um, but if you uh, multiply that distribution, multiply that random variable by a constant, uh, A in this case, uh, then in fact the, the measure of how spread out it is does change. Because you multiply a, a random variable by a constant and it, it sort of spreads it out or shrinks it down. And in fact, for variance, that's the factor by which it spreads it out or shrinks it down. It's the square of the, the multiplicative constant. Okay? Does that make sense? Oh, I guess I just said this. In other words, a shift, shift a distribution and its variance doesn't change. So shifting uh, it corresponds to adding a constant to it. Okay? You shift a distribution, its variance doesn't change. You shrink or spread out a distribution, and its variance changes by the square of the multiplicative factor. Okay. Uh, property number four. So let's suppose we have um, a bunch of random variables x, and we add them up to create a new random variable y. The variance of y is equal to the sum of the variances of the x's. But that's only true if the x's are independent. Okay? So remember when I had, we had a very similar property for expectation. We did not require independence there. We, we require independence here. Why is that? I'm not sure if I can give you a good, I mean, you could, I could show you mathematically why that's true. But I mean, I'm not sure I could give you a good intuition. Uh, yeah, actually, there probably is a sort of a geometric, geometric intuition I could give you, but I might have to think about it for a couple minutes so it would be coherent. So, um, OK. And then property number five um, is, again, sort of a combination of three and four. We have a sort of an arbitrary linear transformation of the x's and the variance of the resulting um, random variable is just going to be equal to the sum of the variances where each variance is multiplied by the square of the multiplicative factor in the, in the linear uh, combination. Okay? And again, here the x's have to be independent for this to be true. And then finally, the sixth property is that the variance of x is equal to the expectation of x squared minus the expectation of x quantity squared. And this is pretty easy to prove if you just start from the sort of definition of variance. Um, it's not too difficult to show this. And um, this can be a pretty useful uh, property when we're computing, if you need to compute the variance of a, a random variable. sometimes. Uh, computing the expectation, um, the, sorry, the expectation squared and the expectation of, of x, um, the expectation of x squared and the expectation of x quantity squared can be an easier thing to do than uh, computing the variance. So anyhow, this can be useful formula for that reason. Uh, calculating expectation of x squared, we just use the previous formula, fx, dx, dx. Yep, yep, yep. So you can do it, you, you can do it in a variety of ways. Uh, one is you can figure out what the distribution of x squared is and compute its expectation, or we can use the formula that we saw at the beginning of the, the lecture. Yep. Okay. Questions about properties of variance? No. Okay. Okay, and then I also want to introduce standard deviation. So standard deviation, we're, we're not going to use as much as variance, but uh, sometimes it's convenient for our measure of dispersion of a distribution 
to have the same units as the random variable itself. Okay? And so for this reason, we, so variance, the units of variance are the units of the, the uh, random variable squared. And here, um, what we do is we just define the standard deviation to be the square root of the variance. <coughs> okay? And um, that's going to have the same units as the, the random variable itself. Okay. So, it, you know, in, in, in a lot of ways, standard deviation and variance are, I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're obviously one's a function of the other, but, you know, they're essentially equivalent ways of measuring the dispersion of a, a distribution. Uh, and sometimes it's easier to use standard deviation and sometimes it's easier to use variance. Okay, so just so you know the definition. Okay. Now, the, we can do something similar. So at the very beginning of the lecture, I gave you the formula for how to calculate the expectation of a function of a random variable. And um, I said, uh, well, I said sometimes that's a lot easier to do uh, than, than actually figuring out what the PDF of the, that function, the random variable is, and then using that to uh, calculate the expectation. Well, sometimes we might, might, might want a shortcut for calculating variance as well. And we can basically just use, uh, the, you know, apply the results of expectation of a function of a random variable and the fact that uh, the variance is in fact an expectation to get a formula for the variance of a function of a random variable. Okay? So, Variance of y is just equal to the expectation of y squared minus the expectation of y quantity squared. And that's uh, one of the properties I just told you. Okay? But we, let's suppose we don't want to calculate the expectation. We don't want to calculate this distribution, this PDF. Okay? And so what we want to do instead is just uh, plug in the formula r of x. and um, calculate the, the expectation of that instead. And so the, using the formula for expectation of a function of a random variable, we get that the variance is equal to this minus this. Okay? So this is just combining to, combining kind of the definition of variance and this property of variance I just showed you with the expectation of a function of a random variable, combining all those things together to get this formula. Okay, so now let's, uh, let me define another quantity that especially as we sort of move into, um, you know, linear regression and other kinds of uh, models, uh, you know, uh, other kinds of models that include sort of multiple random variables. Uh, this is sort of a concept that's going to be very useful for us, okay? And the concept is conditional expectation. So what is a conditional expectation? A conditional expectation is just simply the expectation of a conditional distribution. So remember a couple of lectures ago, we sort of figured out we had a joint distribution, and we talked about computing a conditional distribution. It was just taking a slice and then sort of blowing it up, like normalizing it so that it, it uh, um, integrated to one. So that's a conditional distribution. And um, uh, the, the sort of notion of a conditional expectation is going to be useful going forward. And that is just the expectation of that conditional distribution. Okay? So in some sense, it isn't, it's not quite a new concept. It's just the expectation of a distribution we knew already existed. But um, there's, you know, if we think of uh, the um, conditional distribution more broadly as a function of the conditioning variable, then we can also think of the conditional expectation as a function of this conditioning variable. Okay? And that's going to be sort of a useful thing for us when we're sort of building these linear models. Okay, so this is the definition. It's just expectation of y given x is equal to the integral of y times the, the conditional distribution of y given x. Okay? So nothing, nothing particularly new there. The thing that's new about this is how I want you to think about this quantity. Okay? So note that 
expectation of y given x is a function of the random variable x. Okay? If I plug in a specific realization for x, it's no longer a function of x. But if we keep, you know, if we sort of uh, leave it in this sort of general form, then x, it's a function of the random variable x. And what do we know about functions of random variables? They are also random variables, right? So x is a random variable. That means the expectation of y conditional on x is a random variable. Okay? And then if, as I said, if we just plug in a particular um, realization for x, then it's just a number. Then it's just an expectation, just a number. Okay? So this distinction might seem a little odd to you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a couple of um, uh, laws involving conditional expectation, and then we'll do an example. And I hope the example will sort of uh, not only make this distinction a little clearer, but also give you some idea of why this might be a useful concept. Okay? Okay, so the first, um, the first law that I'm going to tell you is the law of iterated expectations. So remember that, um, so think now of the expectation of y conditional on x being a random variable, because it's a function of random variables. And so we can talk about its expectation, because it itself is a random variable. So the expectation of the expectation of y given x is equal to the expectation of y. That's the, that's the result here. Does this seem mysterious? Yeah. Yeah, it is a little mysterious. The, the proof is actually pretty straightforward, um, but uh, I, don't, I don't think it's necessary for me to show it. But um, the, the, the proof is not the hard part. The hard part is sort of wrapping your mind around the fact that we're treating this conditional expectation as a random variable. It's a function of a random variable, so it is a random variable. And so we can also take the expectation of it. Okay? So it's a little, I don't know, it's a little subtle, I guess. But like I said, I'll, I'll do an example in a couple minutes, and I hope that will help. Okay, and uh, well, secondly, the definition of conditional variance fol follows from that of variance and conditional expectation. And then the second law, the law of total variance, um, the second law I'm going to tell you is that the variance of the expectation of y given x is equal to the expectation of the variance of y given x, or sorry, plus the expectation of the variance of uh, y given x is equal to the variance of y, the unconditional variance of y. Okay, so now we have two laws that tell us how to compute unconditional expectation and variance of y when we have a sort of, we just have conditional moments. Okay, so here are the two, here are the two laws. Okay, so just sort of keep those in the back of your mind. You don't have to memorize them, but um, keep those in the back of your mind as we go through this next ex example. Okay. Okay, so I have a former student, um, and he moved to New York City after graduating from MIT, and he started an innovation incubator. Okay? So suppose he's been doing this for a few years. In reality, I think he's only been doing it for about a year and a half. But suppose he's been doing it for a few years and uh, has kept track of the number of patents produced every year in his incubator. Okay? And he knows that the expectation of n, here n is the number of patents, the expectation of n is equal to 2, and the variance of n is also equal to 2. Okay? So he doesn't know the distribution of patents. He just knows what the expectation and the variance is. Okay? And then let's also suppose that each patent is a commercial success with probability 0.2. And we'll assume that um, we'll assume independence across patents. Okay. Now suppose there 
are five patents this year coming out of his incubator. What is the probability that three are commercial successes? So how would we even think about approaching this problem? So all I told you is a couple of moments of the distribution with which the, the patents are generated. Okay? And then I also told you this piece, which is going to be crucial. What's the probability that three out of the five patents produced this year are going to be commercial successes? Any guesses on how we might proceed? Yes. So so that so your answer was almost entirely correct, but it was kind of more detailed than I was looking for. And it but that's fine. We'll get to we'll get to that detail in a second. What the insight that you had that let you sort of come up with that calculation was that the, you figured out what the conditional distribution of successes, conditional on n was. Okay? You might not have even realized that's what you were doing, but that's what you did. Okay? So um, this, was the, this was the important insight that S conditional on n being equal to some little n is just equal to, uh, is binomial with parameters n and 0.2. Where did that come from? So let's go back. So each patent is a commercial success with probability 0.2, and we can assume independence. So each patent is like a coin flip where the probability of his success is 0.2. We're assuming independence. What is that? That's a binomial distribution. Okay? So basically, just based on this, based on my verbal description, you had to make the sort of leap, the, the um, you know, sort of, uh, I don't know, intellectual leap that what I was saying is that success is conditional on number of patents has a binomial distribution with n, uh, parameters n and 0.2. Okay. So in this case, uh, what I'm saying is uh, the, the question is asking, what's the probability that there are three successes given that there are five patents? And that's just the probability that a binomial random variable with uh, parameters n and 0.2, or 5 and 0.2, I guess, is equal to 3. So the probability that s is equal to 3 given that n is equal to 5 is just equal to, I'm just plugging into the binomial formula here. Okay? Make sense? Sort of? Okay. Okay, so now we can uh, answer, so now that we've had this insight, that we've, we've figured out what the conditional distribution of successes, conditional on patents is. We've had that insight, and now we can uh, sort of do a lot more with that. Okay? Oh, and by the way, that's uh, equal to 5%. Okay? Suppose there are five patents this year. What's the expected number of commercial successes? The same thing for every, every number of success from one, 0 to 5. And that's right. by the probability of this one. Yes, that's right. So there are a couple different ways you could do this. So you could actually just go through and figure out the probability for zero successes, one success, two successes, three, you know, and then use the expectation formula and compute it. That's not exactly how I did it, but that would work perfectly fine. So what I did instead is I knew off the top of my head that the, um, that the expectation of a binomial random variable was equal to NP. Okay, where the parameters, are, the two parameters are n and p. I happen to know that. Um, proving that is, you know, actually a, a, again sort of a fussy uh, calculation. But you can actually, I'll just go ahead. But you can uh, compute the expectation in general of a Bernoulli random variable and then add it up n times. So the expectation of one coin flip, um, you know, being a success is 0.2. That's the Bernoulli. And then since there are five of them, you just add that up five times using 
one of the properties of expectation that we saw before. Okay? So this, is, this gives you a sort of a different way to get the, the uh, expectation. And third way you could get the expectation is you just know this is binomial and you look up the expectation for binomial in a book. Okay? That's a third way you can do it. And so you get NP. And then in this case, n is equal to 5 and p is equal to 0.2. You multiply them and you get 1. Okay? Make sense? Okay, now what's the unconditional expected number of commercial successes? So every, all the calculations we've done so far are conditional on n being equal to 5. But we want to know next year, we don't know how many patents are going to be produced. And what we want to know is you know, maybe uh, you know, my student's putting together his budget for the incubator and he's like trying to figure out how much to charge you know, and, and he gets a certain percentage of commercial successes and so forth. So he has to be able to compute the unconditional expected number of commercial successes because he doesn't know what n next year is going to be. Okay? Yes? He only knows the expected number of patents is to he, yes, he w exactly. That's exactly right. He will use that, but how does he use that? Is that in the binomial distribution? Uh, yeah. More or less, yeah. 2 times 0.2. Yes. So, but, but how, how, did, how did you guys come up with that? Expected number of patents is 2. Expected number probably the success. The law, the, I, think the, I think what you're trying to say is the law of iterated expectations. <laughs> so, yes, exactly. Okay. So what is so how do we use the law of iterated expectations? So now does this does this now make the law of iterated expectations feel a little bit more make make a little bit more sense because that's a calculation you kind of did in your head, right? Without even realizing you were using the law of iterated expectations. So let's use the law of iterated expectations. The unconditional expectation of S is equal to the expectation of the expectation of s conditional on n, okay? n is a random variable here. We haven't, we don't know what the realization is. We're treating it as a random variable. So that is just equal to, well, we plug in the formula for the expectation of a binomial. It's just equal to np. But here I'm using capital N to emphasize the fact that this is still a random variable. Yep? Does this theorem hold for like um, joint distributions um, with, or distributions that have similar variables that are sort of not independent from a uh, yeah, I mean this. This whole yes, I mean this. This holds for all you need is the conditional distribution. Yeah, so it, yeah, it's it's general. It's it. You don't have to have random variables that are independent. Well, yeah, I mean in this particular example, I'm using independence to get the binomial, but that's not relevant to the law of iterated expectations. Okay, so here I'm still using capital N because we're still thinking of capital N as a random variable, okay? So the expectation of capital N times P is just equal to, well, we saw some properties of expectation that tell us if we have a constant P uh, that, and we, we're multiplying a random variable by that constant, well, the expectation of that new random variable is just, we can bring the, the um, uh, constant outside the expectation. Right? That was, what property was that? I don't know, property three of expectations or something. And so we do that. So P, we just plug in P is equal to 0.2. Okay? And that comes outside the expectation because it's just a constant. We're allowed to do that. And then we have expectation of N. We were told at the beginning of the problem that uh, the, my student knows the expectation of N. He can plug that in. We're done. Okay? Make sense? He'd also like to know something about how volatile his income is going to be next year. So he cares about the expectation, but he also cares maybe about you know, probability that he's going to get no income or probability he's going to get a ton of income. And the variance is going to tell us something about that. It tells us how spread out the, the distribution of his income for next year is going to be. Okay? And so how do we calculate the unconditional variance of number of commercial successes? <laughs> the, law the law of total variance, exactly. Okay. There we go. 
So the variance of s is just equal to the variance of the expectation of s conditional on n plus the expectation of the variance of s conditional on n. Somehow that sounded funny, but I think I said it correctly. OK? So now we're going to do something similar to what we did before. We're um, actually, in this case, I put in a little piece that you probably don't know off the top. Of, I knew it off the top of my head because I've been teaching probability for years. You probably don't know off the top of your head that the variance of a binomial random variable is n times p times 1 minus p. OK? Um, so here we plug in the expectation of the binomial random variable, n times p. Again, keeping n as a, as a uh, capital to, to emphasize that it's a random variable. And then we plug in the variance of a binomial. So n, capital N times p times 1 minus p. And then we take the variance of that first thing, the expectation of the second thing. We use now properties of variance and expectation to like pull things outside of the variance and the expectation. Okay, So here we pull out the point 2. The p is equal to point 2. We pull it out the front, but we've got to square it. Remember that? Okay, So we've got point 2 squared times the variance of n plus, and then we just bring out p times 1 minus p out of the expectation because it's just a, it's a constant. We can do that. So we get 0.2 times 1 minus 0.2 times expectation of n. And then uh, you plug in what the variance of n, the unconditional variance of n, and the unconditional expectation of n is into the formula, and you get 0.4. OK? Does this seem like magic? And could you say something about the intuition behind the law of total variance? Pro probably not. The intuition, the intuition behind the law of total variance. Like, why does it make sense that it has those two parts? No. <laughs> I don't think I can. Does anyone have any intuition for the law of total variance? Hmm. Maybe, I'll, maybe I'll ponder that. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very reasonable question, but it's not something I've ever formed an intuition about. So I just, I just think, oh, it's useful, and I can plug in and use it. Yeah. Um, I sort of think that the expectation of the variance is itself is kind of like a mean kind of thing. And the variance of expectation is how much is deviating from the mean. And like if you add those two together. So, it's a, it's a, so you're saying it's some kind of a decomposition yeah, I mean, that's got to be the case. It's some specific kind of decomposition of the variance coming from different sources. Yeah, yeah, that's probably right. Um, yeah, and whether I can say anything, you know, more, more specific now, I'm not sure. But. OK. OK. So we've been talking, we've talked a fair amount about uh, moments of single, of you know, univariate distributions. So we talked about um, expectation, we talked about variance and mentioned standard deviation. Um, but we often are interested in the relationship between random variables. That's what we do a lot of in econometrics. That's what happens in multivariate statistics, et cetera. And um, we have a moment of, an important moment of joint distributions to describe one aspect of the relationship between random variables, and that's covariance. And basically, covariance is a way to describe how closely associated two random variables are. Okay? When we get to properties, that, that'll give you sort of a little bit more information about how to interpret covariance. Um, but the, you know, the way to think about covariance, I suppose, is just that if two random variables are, um, you know, are independent, so if two random variables are independent, we'll see in a second, uh, their uh, covariance is equal to zero. And if two random variables are very closely related, uh, then they're going to have um, a high covariance. Okay? So, how do we define covariance? Well, we define it as the expectation of x minus mu sub x times y minus mu sub y. 
So that, that uh, function, the expectation of that function of random variables. And we often denote it with a sigma sub xy. Okay? Why, I'm not sure, I mean, well, that's how we, I should just say, that's how we often denote it. You might think it might make sense to denote it sigma squared sub xy, but this is how we often denote it. Okay. Okay. And then we also have a standardized version of this called correlation. So a correlation, we'll often use the, a row to, uh, to denote correlation. So either row of xy or sometimes row sub xy, we use that notation as well. And that's just equal to the covariance divided by the square root of the variance of x and the square root times the square root of the variance of y. Okay? So we'll see some things about properties of uh, correlation and sort of its relationship with covariance in a second. Okay, well here's, I guess here's the first bit of that. So um, we, this is just sort of terminology. We say that the random variables x and y are positively correlated if rho is greater than zero. And we say they're negatively correlated if rho is less than zero. And we say that uh, they're uncorrelated if rho is equal to zero. Okay? And for some reason, we don't have similar terminology with covariance. But it doesn't, it actually doesn't matter. This is sort of equivalent to what, we, you know, we don't call something uncovaried or something like that. We just call it uncorrelated. Okay, so let's go through some properties of covariance and correlation as well. So first of all, you might have noticed that from the, the, uh, the definition of covariance, that it was very similar to the definition of variance, but it involved two variables. And in fact, uh, the covariance, if you plug in x and itself into the covariance formula, you just get uh, the variance of x. Okay. Uh, you might also notice from the definition that um, you can, you know, sort of switch the uh, places of x and y and you're still going to get the same value. So the, when we saw properties of variance, there was a property of variance at the very end that I said is sometimes useful for calculating variance and it's pretty easy to prove. Well, this is sort of the counterpart for covariance. So you can show uh, not too, and it's not too difficult. You can show that the covariance of x and y is equal to the expectation of x times y minus the expectation of x times the expectation of y. Okay? So remember the, the sort of counterpart for that, for variance, was that the variance of x was equal to the expectation of x squared minus the expectation of x quantity squared. Okay, uh, if we have two random variables x and they're independent, that implies that their covariance is equal to zero. So if you have two random variables whose covariance is equal to zero, you, that does not in fact imply that they're independent. Um, although in most cases that we're going to see in this class, um, uh, random variables with covariance zero will be independent. But that de the implication definitely does not go the other way. Okay, um, so this is a property um, having to do with uh, sort of linear transformations of random variables. So you take uh, x and um, transform it, uh, you know, sort of linearly transform it, and take y and linearly transform it uh, using different constants. And the covariance of x and y uh, gets multiplied by the coefficients on, um, on x and y. Okay. The additive, um, the additive constants uh, b and d don't do anything to change the covariance. Ah, so remember, when we saw uh, properties of variance, we said that if if x, well, we actually saw this in the in a more general form for x. Um, one up through xn, 
but in you know if we only had two x's we saw a property that said if x and x1 and x2 are independent then the variance of the the uh, sorry the, the variance of the sum of the x's is equal to uh, the sum of the variances but only if they're independent okay here this gives us a formula for, at least in the case of two uh, random variables, for calculating the variance of the sum when they're not independent. Okay. Okay. The seventh uh, property I want to mention is that a row is always less than or equal to one in absolute value. Okay. So row goes from negative one uh, to positive one, and it's it's actually it can be very handy. Uh, to have, so covariance can be uh, greater than one uh, or less than negative one. And sometimes it's handy to have sort of a, this kind of units free um, moment that describes how closely associated two random variables are. And in particular, if the absolute value of rho is equal to one, so it's either equal to one or negative one, um, then that implies that y is a linear transformation of x, and, and actually the implication goes the other way as well. Okay? So basically, if you have two random variables and they're perfectly correlated, either with correlation coefficient 1 or negative 1, then you know that there is a linear relationship between those two random variables. Okay, so now with all of these sort of definitions, properties, tools, and things like that under our belt, I am going to give you a little preview of regression. So still, we're going to talk about, in, in the next couple of minutes, we're going to talk about linear regression. It's still going to be in the context of probability. Um, so I'm, we're, not, we're not actually talking about estimating the parameters of a linear regression yet. We'll get there. Um, we're going to talk about uh, linear regression in the context of probability. But I hope this is going to give you a little bit of a sense for uh, what, um, you know, what's, what's coming up in this class, what's, what's, uh, what we're going to be covering um, you know, sort of in the weeks to come. OK. So let's suppose we have two random variables, x and y. And uh, the expectation, we're going to denote the expectation of x as mu sub x, and the expectation of y as mu sub y. And uh, likewise, we're going to denote the variances of x and y in this sort of standard way. And rho sub x, y, the correlation, uh, is just um, you know, sort of equal to um, sort of the standard definition. Well, I just told you that if the correlation was equal to 1, Actually, I didn't tell you this, but this is true. I told you something close to this. If the correlation is equal to 1, then y is equal to a plus bx with b positive. And if rho is equal to negative 1, then y is equal to a plus bx, b negative. Okay? So I told you that there is a linear relationship if the absolute value of this is equal to 1. So this just gives you a little more information. If rho is less, strictly less than 1 in absolute value, then we can't write y and x as a linear combination of each other. Okay? But what we can do is we can write y as a linear function of x plus another <laughs> random variable. And we'll call that other random variable u. Okay. So here we've got a random variable u that we tacked on here. Uh, we'll talk about the interpretation of it in a second. Um, but what can we say about it? Can we say anything about how u, is, how u behaves or what its properties are or anything like that? Well, it depends on how we define alpha and beta. Okay? So let's suppose that just falling out of the sky, we're told that we should define beta as rho sub xy times sigma sub y over sigma sub x. 
You don't have to worry about where this comes from at this point. And let's say we were told that we should define alpha as mu sub y minus beta mu sub x. Okay? Then u has the following properties. Um, u, sorry, u defined as y minus alpha. Oh, I think that's supposed to be minus beta. Yeah. So u is equal to y minus alpha minus beta x has the following properties. The expectation of u is equal to 0. And the covariance between x and u is also equal to 0. Okay. So you don't have to take my word for it. Uh, you can show these two things pretty easily using properties of expectation, variance, and covariance uh, that we've seen. And so maybe that will be on the problem set that I need to put together this afternoon. So you may see that soon. Okay. But basically, if we define alpha and beta this way, then u has those properties. Okay. So what, how, do we, how do we think about x, y, u? How do we think about their relationship in, in a case like this? Yep. Um, what is the covariance between x and a function of x? Uh, so the covariance between x and a function of x, uh, it, it, it just depends on the function. There's nothing I can say generally about it. Yeah. OK. So um, then in, in, the, in the case that I have um, sort of discussed here, uh, the alpha and beta have a particular name. They're called the regression coefficients Okay, in a bivariate regression. And the way that we think about um, the way that we think about the relationship among these random variables is that we think of alpha plus beta x as the part of y. We're sort of decomposing the variation that we see in y. And we think of alpha plus beta x as the part of y that's explained by x. And u as the part that's unexplained by x. Okay? And we're, why, how do we get this interpretation? Well. In particular, notice that we've chosen alpha and beta so that covariance of x and u is equal to 0. Okay? So we, we really, you know, the, the um, x and u are sort of, um, you know, they have covariance 0. It means that they're completely uncorrelated. Uh, they don't have, um, yeah, I don't know how else to explain it exactly. And so the, the, the um, you know, the, the sort of part of the variation that we see in, in y uh, that is explained by this sort of linear function of x is you know, sort of the, the um, you know, I don't know. Or, or that's, well, how do I say this? The, we're decomposing the variation we see in y into the part that's explained by this linear uh, function of x and this sort of uncorrelated part. And we're, we typically think of u in a regression context as being the error term. Okay? So anyhow, this doesn't, you don't have to understand or sort of completely have you know, a clear intuition of what's going on here. But this is one way to think about uh, linear regression. And we'll see other ways um, later on in the semester. Okay? Questions? No? Nope. Okay, so uh, I have two other quick things to go through. And uh, these are two inequalities involving uh, probabilities and uh, distributions of random variables that do come in handy from time to time. Okay. Uh, the first one is called the Markov inequality. So let's suppose you have a random variable x and it's always non-negative. Then for any uh, t, any constant t that's positive, the probability that x is greater than or equal to that uh, constant t is less than or equal to the expectation of x over t. Okay? So basically, how much probability is out in the right tail of this random variable x is bounded by the expectation, some function of the expectation of x. Okay? Which I guess makes sense, right? I mean, if, you know, it, 
the expectation is a function of you know sort of the the probability density in all parts of the support and so if you have sort of a lot of probability out in the right tail um, then that's going to pull the expectation out so it's not surprising that the there is this relationship between the probability in the right tail and the expectation so let me draw just a couple of pictures so what the Markov uh, inequality tells us let's suppose we have a uniform distribution over on the left and the uniform distribution um, let's see the Markov inequality tells us the probability that the uh, uniform distribution or the, the a random variable with that uniform distribution is going to be greater than t is bounded that p, that slice of the distribution is bounded above by the expectation of that distribution divided by t okay and the same thing is true for you know any shape of non-negative random variable. So do keep in, in mind that the Markov inequality is only for random variables that are always non-negative. Okay? But this is going to be true for any, any non-negative random variable for which expectation exists. Okay? The second inequality is the Chebyshev inequality. So for Chebyshev, uh, we need that x is a random variable uh, whose variance exists. And, uh, but it doesn't need to be a non-negative random variable. Then for any constant t greater than zero, uh, we have that the probability that x minus the expectation, absolute value, is greater than or equal to t is less than or equal to the variance of x over t squared. Okay, so basically what the Chebyshev inequality is doing is it's putting bounds on both tails of the distribution. And I'll, I have pictures for that as well. Okay. So it's putting bounds on both tails of the distribution, and those bounds are a function of the variance. Okay. So basically, if you have a, uh, if you have a, um, a random variable with an expectation and, you know, whose expectation and variance exists, basically if you look more than t away from the expectation on, in both tails. And you sort of add up that probability that's more than t away from the expectation in both tails. That probability is going to be bounded above by the variance of x over t squared. We use two Markov inequalities. Can we sort of define like an asymmetric Chebyshev? Uh, I believe that is true. So the Chebyshev inequality can be derived from the Markov inequality. So, it, it, so my guess is you could it, you could derive other flavors of the Chebyshev inequality as well. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So that's it. We'll call it a day, and we'll start talking about the sample mean next time. <laughs>